Back in the 2010s, commuters in North America were facing a familiar problem. The highways were full, the trains were crowded, and the daily drive into the city was wearing people down. Transit agencies needed something that could move more passengers without adding more drivers, a bus that could stretch capacity in a single trip. For decades, the answer had been the standard 45-foot coach, a workhorse like the MCI D4500 carrying about 57 riders at a time. Reliable, yes. Efficient, somewhat. But with populations swelling in places like the Greater Toronto Area, those numbers no longer added up. In Ontario, the agency known as GO Transit had already experimented with double-deckers. Riders loved the commanding view from the upper deck, and the extra seating helped absorb rush-hour crowds. But there was a catch. Many downtown terminals had low ceilings, and traditional double-deckers stood too tall. They simply couldn't clear the roof lines at Union Station or York Mills. The dream of a two-deck solution seemed destined to stay limited to certain routes. That is, until Alexander Dennis, a builder from across the Atlantic with fresh eyes on the North American market, unveiled a new idea, a double-decker built lower, leaner, and ready for the tight clearances that had always stood in the way. The challenge came down to infrastructure. North American cities were never designed with double-deck buses in mind. In Europe, roadways and stations had long accommodated tall vehicles, but across Canada and the United States, low bridges, utility wires, and older terminals created constant obstacles. For GO Transit, the problem was especially visible in Toronto. Key hubs like Union Station and York Mills were critical to the network, yet their ceilings were too low to admit a standard 13-foot, 6-inch double-decker. That meant the very places where capacity was needed most were off-limits. Transit planners faced a frustrating trade-off. They could stick with conventional coaches, sacrificing dozens of potential seats, or run taller double-deckers only on certain suburban routes, leaving riders downtown with no benefit. Neither option solved the real issue. How to move large commuter crowds efficiently into the heart of the city. Riders demanded more comfort and space, but the infrastructure pushed back at every turn. This was the setting into which Alexander Dennis stepped. Rather than forcing agencies to rebuild terminals or re-engineer bridges, the company looked at the problem from the vehicle side. What if the bus itself could adapt? What if a double-decker could be engineered just low enough to clear Toronto's tightest spots while still offering the upper deck view passengers craved? Out of that question, the concept of the super low was born. By 2014, the answer had taken shape. At a trade show in North America, Alexander Dennis revealed the Enviro 500 Super Low, a bus that looked every bit a double-decker, but stood at just 12 feet 10 inches tall. That small reduction in height, only about 8 inches compared with the standard model, was enough to clear the stubborn roof lines that had frustrated agencies for years. The design caught immediate attention. Go Transit quickly signed on as the launch customer. In 2015, the first order was placed, signaling a bold shift in the way Ontario would move its commuters. Transit officials were eager to see if the new design could really deliver high capacity without the headaches of restricted routes. By late 2016, the first production units, numbered in the 8300 series, were delivered and entered service. For riders, it was a novelty at first. A two-deck bus rolling into Union Station, where no double-decker had ever fit before. For Go Transit, it was validation. The Super Low wasn't just a concept on paper. It was a practical solution to an old problem, and one that carried the promise of reshaping the region's commuter landscape. The timeline was swift, but the impact was lasting. When the Super Low finally rolled onto the streets, the numbers told the story as much as the sight of the bus itself. At 45 feet 4 inches long and 8 feet 5 inches wide, it matched the footprint of a standard North American highway coach. The critical difference was the height, 12 feet 10 inches, just low enough to slip into terminals that had rejected taller double-deckers. That figure may sound small,
but in practice it made the difference between being sidelined and being central to the commuter network. Inside, the Super Low could seat 81 passengers, 57 upstairs and 24 down below. Compared with a typical MCI D4500, which held about 57 riders, it represented a gain of nearly 40% capacity without adding another driver. For agencies counting every dollar, that math was hard to ignore. There were two ADA-compliant wheelchair positions, a folding ramp at the front door, and overhead luggage racks to help ease the load of long-distance commuters. Power came from a Cummins L9 diesel engine producing 380 horsepower and 1,250 pound-feet of torque paired with an Allison B500R transmission. With a gross weight rating over 57,000 pounds, the drivetrain had its work cut out, but operators reported solid performance on the highway. The tighter 43-foot turning radius also meant the big double-decker could handle bus terminals and city streets more gracefully than its size suggested. Not everything was flawless. The lower deck, pressed down to save height, felt a little snug for tall riders. Luggage space was adequate but not generous, and the heavy chassis inevitably consumed more fuel and brake life than a lighter single-deck coach. Yet for passengers climbing the stairs to the upper deck, those drawbacks were easy to overlook. The Super Low delivered the sweeping view and extra seats they had always wanted, now in places where double-deckers had never gone before. What set the Super Low apart was not simply that it was shorter, but how that reduction was achieved. Engineers at Alexander Dennis didn't want to sacrifice the sense of space on the upper deck, the very feature riders loved. Instead, they rethought the structure from the ground up. By lowering the chassis and reconfiguring the suspension, they trimmed nearly eight inches off the overall profile while still keeping the upstairs headroom at about five feet seven inches. That meant passengers climbing the stairs could still sit comfortably and enjoy the panoramic view without stooping. The lower deck carried the trade-off. To gain clearance for terminals with tight roof lines, Designers had to compress the space down to just over six feet. For many commuters, this was fine, but taller riders sometimes found it a bit confining compared with the open aisle of a conventional coach. The aisle was narrower as well, a reminder of the compromises necessary to win those precious inches of clearance. Still, the advantages outweighed the drawbacks. Boarding was easier thanks to the low entry floor, which made stepping inside less of a climb, something older riders and those carrying bags appreciated immediately. The wheelchair ramp at the front door tied directly into the low chassis, reducing the slope and simplifying access. For agencies, the payoff was clear, a double-decker that could finally fit into downtown stations without demanding costly renovations. It was a clever balance of engineering and practicality, reshaping what a commuter bus could be on North American roads. When the first super-low buses entered service with Go Transit in late 2016, they quickly proved their worth. For the first time, a double-decker could pull into Union Station's bus terminal without scraping a ceiling or being rerouted elsewhere. The same was true at York Mills and Hamilton, stations that had long been off-limits to taller models. Riders noticed the change immediately. Suddenly, they could enjoy the elevated view and extra seating capacity on routes where double-deckers had never been allowed. The practical advantages went even further. With 81 seats compared to the 57 found on a typical highway coach, the super-low let-go move rush-hour crowds more efficiently. That meant fewer buses clogging the 401 or the Gardiner Expressway, and fewer passengers left standing in suburban park-and-ride lots. For drivers, the bus handled predictably on highways, and the 43-foot turning radius helped it maneuver inside busy terminals better than many expected. Still, there were lessons. The ADA ramp at the front door, while effective, deployed slowly. During peak boarding, it could delay schedules just enough to frustrate operators. Go also implemented a geofencing system to ensure the new double-deckers stayed within safe corridors, reducing the risk of accidental detours under low bridges. 
Those precautions underscored both the promise and the challenges of operating such a tall, heavy machine in the North American landscape. For transit agencies, the math behind the superlow was hard to ignore. A standard 45-foot MCI D4500 coach could seat about 57 passengers. The Enviro 500 Superlow, at nearly the same length, carried 81. That 40% jump in capacity came without adding another driver, another shift, or another fuel bill. In an era where labor was the single largest cost in transit, squeezing more riders onto a single bus was a game changer. For GO Transit, the advantage played out on highways like the 401. Instead of dispatching three coaches to handle the morning rush, two superlos could do the job with room to spare. That translated into fewer vehicles idling in traffic, fewer mechanics tied up with additional buses, and a smoother flow of passengers through suburban park-and-ride lots. It wasn't just about moving people, it was about using resources more efficiently. Yet higher capacity didn't come free. At over 57,000 pounds gross weight, the superlow was heavier than a conventional coach. More mass meant more diesel burned per mile and more strain on brakes, tires, and suspension components. Operators found themselves balancing fuel savings from fewer trips against maintenance costs that crept upward over time. Still, most agreed the trade-off was worth it. The superlow's ability to move more commuters in one sweep outweighed the extra upkeep especially in crowded corridors where every seat counted. The Superlow wasn't only a clever design, it was also a strategic build. Final assembly took place in Vaughan, Ontario, giving GO Transit buses made close to home and creating local jobs. That choice also meant quicker support with parts and service nearby rather than shipped across an ocean. For U.S. sales, Alexander Dennis emphasized another essential factor. Buy America compliance. Meeting federal content rules allowed agencies south of the border to use federal funding, something no foreign-built bus could ignore. It gave the super low a real chance in a market long dominated by domestic names like MCI and Provost. Still, the advantages came with trade-offs. Specialized components and a higher upfront price made the bus less appealing for smaller systems. Stocking unique parts added costs, and not every fleet wanted that commitment. For large operators, though, the equation was clear. More capacity, backed by local assembly and a ticket into U.S. funding channels. When the Super Low appeared in 2014, the Enviro 500 was already a proven platform. Since 2002, the standard 13-foot 6-inch model had become a common sight in Hong Kong, Singapore, and later across North America with Megabus and Coach USA. It was the tall, roomy double-decker that worked wherever infrastructure allowed. The Super Low took a different path. At 12 feet 10 inches, it was engineered specifically for Toronto's low terminals. Riders still enjoyed 81 seats and the upstairs view, but in a profile slim enough to clear Union Station and York Mills. The design solved a local problem brilliantly, yet its appeal was narrower. Few agencies outside Ontario faced the same combination of demand and clearance issues, which limited adoption. Meanwhile, Alexander Dennis pointed toward the future with battery electric Enviro 500s. These promised zero emissions but brought the challenges of charging and range. Compared with those experiments, the Super Low was practical and proven, but ultimately a specialist, tied closely to the conditions of its birthplace. For riders, the Super Low quickly felt different. Boarding was easier thanks to the low floor. No steep climb, just a step inside. Seniors, parents with strollers, and commuters carrying bags noticed the difference right away. The wheelchair ramp at the front door tied neatly into the lower chassis, making access smoother, though it still deployed slowly at times. Downstairs offered quick entry and exit, with wide windows but a ceiling just over six feet. Most riders found it fine, though taller commuters sometimes felt the squeeze compared with a single-deck coach. Upstairs was the highlight. With 57 seats and a broad view of the road ahead, the ride felt open and even a little special. 
Watching the city rise from the second story of a bus gave everyday trips a new flavor. The drawback came at rush hour, when the single staircase created bottlenecks, but for most passengers, the view more than made up for it. In the story of North American Transit, the Alexander Dennis Enviro 500 Super Low stands as proof that design can adapt. It wasn't just a European import, it was reshaped for the tight terminals and highways of Ontario. By trimming its height without losing capacity, it turned once forbidden stations like Union into everyday stops. Suddenly, thousands of commuters could ride upstairs, enjoying a skyline view that felt fresh on familiar roads. Like the GMRTS before it, the Superlow became more than a bus. It was a symbol of its era, carrying more people with fewer vehicles and easing pressure on crowded freeways. If you've ever climbed its stairs or watched Toronto roll past from the upper deck, share your memories in the comments. And if you enjoy revisiting the machines that carried our daily lives, be sure to like and subscribe. We've got more stories on the road ahead.